Thanks for joining me in Sheffy's Sandbox. I'm your host, April Dawn Scheffler, and I invite you to play with me and my guest today, Bianca Davis. Welcome, Bianca. Hello, hello. <laughs> well, before we get started, we drop into a virtual coffee house before hitting the beach. And being the benevolent host that I am, your order's on me. So what order do you give the barista? Oh, I am not a person who has the same drink all the time. I pick a different drink all the time. I love adventure. Obviously, I love adventure because that's just who I am. My coffee order today is a cold brew vanilla sweet cream. Excellent. Yeah. Now that you have your refreshing beverage, let's dive right in. That will be the only vanilla thing from me today, by the way. Because it's too much sugar or what? No. So vanilla is what kinky people call normal people. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to be learning so much today. <laughs> okay. This next segment is called, I think I know you from somewhere. So in your spotlight moments, Bianca, have there been any claims to fame times that our listeners may have seen you or your work? Maybe, probably not, but I hope. I'm on Instagram, Body Mind B, and I have created kink therapy, naked yoga and nearly naked yoga. So if you are in the Houston area and you are in the events there, a super random claim to fame that popped in my head that nobody will have ever seen was in college. One of the articles that I wrote for my school newspaper was officially cited as a source in an official Department of Defense report, which I thought was super cool. That's probably the most famous thing I've ever done. Guests are asked to choose a word or phrase that they would like to hear used more often in everyday conversation, something that doesn't get enough play or enough airtime, and the prior guest chose the word refine. So you are tasked to try to somehow fit that into our conversation today. Now, you also get to choose a word for the next guest to dance with, and it could be a peculiar word that you find funny or just something that's resonating with you. So what are you laying down for them to pick up? Without knowing who your guests are or what they do, I'm going to choose a word that really relates to what I do, and hopefully a lot of other people are talking about this word, and that word is embody. So this is where we get into the meat of the interview. I was trying to piece together how you and I met, and I'm not exactly clear. I know that we were both at Ecstatic Forest Festival, and you hosted the naked yoga portion, but there were so many excellent choices that were happening at the same time. There were four tents, and it was just so aggravating because sometimes two of the things I wanted to do were happening at the same time. So I did not attend the, the naked yoga. I went to another tent for a different activity, but are you able to shed any light on that? <laughs> yeah. The platform that I use to host my events is the platform that created Ecstatic Forest Fest, which is uniquemindfulevents.com. Mm, okay. That, that would be it then. And so you might've just seen the event and been like, heck, I really wanted to go to this at Ecstatic Forest and now it's here and I do get to go to it. See, that is so, okay. Now it's all coming together. I'm remembering now. <laughs> I feel like that's what you said at the circle. It was. And now that you said that, I'm actually remembering that I said that during my radio diary while at the event is that it was really interesting if I just followed my, my body's authority and that gut intuition that I realized afterwards that these opportunities I thought I had missed out on I was actually granted that opportunity again. So I didn't realize you were from Houston, but by listening to my intuition and I attended this other event that it's likely I would not have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to visit again. Yeah, it came back around where I was like, oh wow, she's a Houston person and I can actually see her in person. So you do naked yoga and all of those really cool things to help people embody. Embody 
Let me ask you that. What are we trying to embody? When people say embodiment or embody, what does that mean to you? So embodiment to me, you can embody many things, right? You can choose to embody various archetypes, right? If we think about different kind of not personalities, but some of the big ones that I work with a ruler archetype, like king or queen energy, you can put that on like an energetic costume and soak it into your body. To me, that is embodiment. You can embody the healer archetype, the mystic archetype, the poet archetype, the artist, the creative, the mother, the grandmother even. You don't have to be a mother or a grandmother to tap into mother or grandmother energy. So for me, embodiment is very much working with archetypes. But in the general sense, you hear it a lot with maybe embodying your divine feminine. And again, that's an archetype. We just don't maybe name it as such, but embodying your divine feminine. You can also embody emotions, right? You can embody peace. You can embody love. You can embody joy. You can also embody rage, right? Or destruction. So whatever it is, it's bringing it into your body and moving from that energy. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So with naked yoga, what are we embodying? Yeah, answer that for us. <laughs> so that is really up to who attends. But I talk about the reason that we do naked yoga is to step into our next level of liberation. So for somebody that might be embodying liberation or embodying freedom in and of itself, and that is something that we guide people to do through the process of the ceremony, because it's not just naked yoga. When we do the events, it's a whole ceremony where we start clothed and then eventually get to this level of freedom where we alchemize and embody the lessons that we are taking away, that we have planted the seeds in the earlier part of the ceremony. So that can look different for different people. Do you remember what your cards were by any chance? I think one of the Oracle cards that I pulled during the event was about community. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what the other one was. Okay. So there's leader energy in that, right? And there's this idea of getting rid of the layers that prevent you from that next level of embodiment or that next level of liberation, stepping into who you're becoming by unbecoming. While we're on the topic of the event that I attended, there was so much attention to detail. We were celebrating a solar eclipse. Solar eclipse. Thank you. You're welcome. And it was during what season? Taurus. <laughs> Taurus. Okay. I have a Taurus moon. And so everything that would appeal to the Taurus sensibilities, you had it there. So we had, as a Taurus moon, I, I love to eat. So there were chocolates there, chocolate covered strawberries and these little love chocolates that had these awesome, really deep philosophical truths on the wrappers. <laughs> We could have just used those instead of the Oracle cards, Yeah, <laughs> but they were a, a nice compliment. And then there were roses and every sense, it just tantalized all of them because Taurus is all about embodiment and utilizing mm -hmm. and engaging all of the senses to really enjoy life in a physical form mm -hmm. and all these little creature comforts. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this woman, if she is not a, an event planner, she should be <laughs> because again, every little detail had already been thought of. And I don't know. I just felt like I was being like, wooed. Wooed. like wooed. I was yeah. <laughs> it was really, really nice. I, I really enjoyed it. And one of the things that I have found out from following you is that 
someone might think if they hear naked yoga that you are one of those people that's an exhibitionist or so damn proud of your body and that kind of thing. And I realized from what you were saying, because you do share a very authentic story on social media, that that is not necessarily or hasn't necessarily been the case for you. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Sure. That's why I do it. I struggled, I suffered, I suffered, I don't like using the word suffered, but I did struggle with body dysmorphia since age 12, and that developed later into a couple of different eating disorders at various different points in my life. I used to hyper fixate on certain parts of my body and just certain parts of my body, certain parts of my mind, certain parts of my personality that I just didn't think were good enough or that were too much or that just didn't really have any business being part of me. And so I rejected aspects of myself for a really long time. I wasted a lot of time and a lot of years of my life spending a lot of energy, just generally disliking myself and at times actively hating myself and working to change who I was. And there can be something said for being on a growth journey and wanting to change parts of yourself. But if you want a lasting change, you don't do it from a place of self-hatred. It's never going to stick. I'm a personal trainer and a yoga teacher and a health coach. And so a lot of people will come to me and they will want to change their body. And that is great. But the first thing we work on is self-love Because approaching any type of body transformation from a place of this isn't right and this is wrong and I have to fix this, you're never going to stick with it. You're going to end up in a shame cycle of punishment and then you're going to rebound and backfire to the comfortable pattern where you felt safe and secure and then you're going to have a shame cycle of guilt and then you're going to go back to punishment and you're going to just keep doing that. So when we approach it from a place of while my body is amazing and wonderful for the things that it can do and for the fact that it is mine and it is proof of creation and proof of God's love for me, then then you can change, right? Then fitness and yoga and nutrition become acts of worship, become acts of reverence and movement becomes a way to honor your body. Nutrition becomes a way to honor your body. So this was not something I figured out overnight. This took years and years and years and years of doing it wrong and wondering why I felt so broken. And then realizing that actually I'm not broken. The system is broken and it's the system that needs to change. And it's the system that we use to approach ourselves. And so I still have moments of of difficulty, but I know how to pull myself out of the moments of difficulty. It's not always sunshines and rainbows. Sometimes it's just noticing the negative thought about your body or about your mind or about who you are, whatever, noticing. And then now the awareness of the negative thought becomes the new choice point where you can replace it with a positive one, where you can take action from that place and remind yourself the truth of who you really are. So yeah, that's why we naked yoga. We naked yoga to love ourselves and worship our bodies even more deeply than we already do or to start that journey. If a lot of my professional, my outward facing persona is like naked yoga, I think for a lot of people on the outside looking in, that would be perhaps another trigger or another thing to help trigger that body dysmorphia, knowing that people are looking at you or that you're modeling for others what it looks like to, to be fit. You're modeling this, this yoga practice, this wellness practice. So has it been at all triggering to be in the public eye with that, like in, in your complete glory? (laughs) Uh Not anymore, not anymore, but certainly when I was in recovery 
and had just moved back. Well, when I started becoming, like when I first became a personal trainer, certainly, and I didn't realize it was a trigger. It was just like, I have to do this because it's my job. Uh, and like, I have to be like, I'm a walking advertisement for my business. And mm-hmm. but this is conditioning, right? This yes. is who tells us what fits looks like, or who tells us what healthy looks like and fit and healthy don't necessarily look like anything. They are lifestyle choices that we can embody and they don't necessarily have to manifest. There's a ton of different reasons why we have different shapes and sizes. And there is not one body type that is standard for human being. So when I started as a personal trainer and as a yoga teacher, especially as a yoga teacher, I had so much resistance to sharing about my yoga practice, even on social media. But then how are you going to grow a yoga business if you don't share your yoga practice on social media? We are finally getting over this hump where for so long, I swore to myself that I wouldn't be that perfect yoga person. I wouldn't have the picture perfect social media, but I just didn't know how to do it another way because that's all I saw modeled to me. And then becoming a personal trainer, it was very much the same thing. And then I went into recovery. I went into a treatment facility and I went into recovery and they were like, Hey, did you know that this is a really big trigger? And I was like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I get it. I remember going to a conference with my mom, who's also in fitness. And that's where a lot of my eating disorder and negative body image started because she had a very prescriptive, like that person shouldn't wear that because their body, whatever, or you shouldn't eat that because of whatever you shouldn't all these things I embodied, I took into my, into my existence and made up all these little rules. And so I remember going to this conference with my mom and checking into the hotel and then having a panic attack and having to go cry in the bathroom because I just felt not as fit as everybody else. And then I, and I walked myself out of the process, right? I used some of the tools that I teach other people. And I walked myself out of the process and I remembered that it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm not doing it for anybody else. I'm doing it for myself as an act of self-love. So was that recovery for the eating disorder? Mm. So it was for an eating disorder, for drug addiction, and for a mental health breakdown. I can't remember the exact quote, but it was talking about how sometimes these nervous breakdowns are Mm -hmm. actually just these, oh, I wish I could remember it, but we have it negatively stigmatized when actually they can be these spiritual transformative moments. Yeah. So we should stop shaming those things and really, I mean- Praise them. Yeah, celebrate the, the, the shift because yeah. whenever you get to the point where n- everything you've been told or conditioned, you know it doesn't work for you anymore and yeah. you just can't anymore with that, that belief system, that behavior system, whatever, it doesn't work and you just can't move a step further with it. So the system breaks and it allows you an opportunity to feel like, okay, everything's broken. How do I want to move forward? And How do so, I rebuild myself up from a place that feels good in my body? How do I create, it was almost like creating a person. Like, How do I rebuild myself back up and put all the pieces back together? Because I, I was non-functional. I had severe PTSD completely non-functional gluten nervous system just meltdown and I lived in that state for two years before I sought help just trying and I was self-medicating with a lot of different drugs and alcohol and compulsive behaviors I was just not okay Mm -hmm. but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because through that process I was really lucky to have found yoga and meditation before that, just before, but before. And so I was able to walk myself through that process and hang on by the threads that I did have 
and get myself to a point where I felt safe enough to go into recovery because I had a mindfulness practice, because I had started my healing journey and because I had yoga, it had given me awareness. It had given me insight. And so, yeah, that's, that's why I teach what I do because I know that we hold on to so much and maybe you haven't had that full catastrophic breakdown, but you might be holding it together with maladaptive coping strategies that aren't really serving you. This next part I can edit out depending how comfortable you are with it. So don't, don't freak out. Okay. <laughs> During the naked yoga session with these women during the solar eclipse, you had revealed to us that you had recently become sober. Mm. Is that, are you still, still sober from that, from that, those spirits? <laughs> yes. Yes. So spirit moved me that my next level of healing and my next level of, it's really not my next level of healing. Like I'd already done the healing work, even in my trauma because I had the awareness, because I had developed somatic tools, like in the somatic awareness that I had developed from chronic pain, from the PTSD, from being nonverbal and not being able to communicate. I had so much internal awareness that I developed these tools, which are actually the same tools that people use in somatic therapy, but I have zero training in actual somatic therapy. It's all intuitively developed. So one day I was doing my somatic work and unwinding my body, letting go of tension, listening to the stories that were coming up. And I heard a voice that said, now is the moment. Take all your things and put them by the dumpster. Because a week prior, I had tried to throw everything in the bin. And several times I had tried to throw everything in the trash can. And I just went back to the trash can and got them out because I was an addict. And that's what, that's what addicts do. And so I just put it by the dumpster knowing that somebody would be like, wow, look at this treasure box that I had just found and take it. And so that's what I did. And the next day it was a naked yoga class that just one person showed up and she had been sober 13 years. And I was like, Hey, we should just do the naked yoga and then maybe get some wine and just hang out. And she's like, well, actually I'm sober. And I was like, well, we should do the naked yoga and then we should talk because I've been thinking about this for four years. Because when I was in recovery, in treatment, I had done sobriety because it was a requirement of being in the facility. Well, it was outpatient, but still residential outpatient. Sobriety was a requirement and I, I did the hundred days, so like three and a half months. And then I celebrated my hundred days in, a, in an unhealthy way. I'm not going to get into the specifics. And then sobriety was over for me. But yes, I am. I've just passed 100 days. I'm at like 107 days, 108 days or something like that without any drops of alcohol. I have had on occasion, like I was in Seattle and it's a legal state. And so I did have some pot while I was in Seattle, but I did it in a healthy way. I did it in a way that I used in my somatic process and I didn't overdo it. And to me, that was even harder than just not having it at all because moderation was, is not something that my body knows. And I don't want to approach things from a place of demonization. Like this is bad. We should avoid it. I'm not a prescriptive person and I'm not sober because of any particular consequences or, or bad things that have happened. Certain people who have experienced a lot of consequences might have a different opinion on sobriety. For me, sobriety was just a challenge. Can I do this for a year? Will I reevaluate in a year and see how it's going? Things with alcohol have been going great. I don't miss it at all. It was way easier than I thought it was. Like my drink of choice when I go out is a Sprite with eight limes, lots of lime, lots of lime in the spray. And it's, delicious or the virgin margarita and I cut it with club soda instead of with tequila I just take that out and put club soda in and it's it's amazing my partner will still drink and I'll still go with him to the bars and sit and enjoy my time in the place that I'm at and enjoy the environment but I don't feel a need or a desire to take that into my body so yeah well, congratulations on the over 100 days. 
Yeah, I just know that whenever I hear anyone having a a relationship with alcohol that seems to take more than it gives, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, I like to talk about it if the person's willing, because I think it's so much more prevalent than, yeah. I don't know, we like to think about. People kind of don't want to think that they are addicted to alcohol. You can be addicted to other things, but alcohol is something that you drink. You can't be addicted. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you this one. I feel like that sentiment exists even more so with marijuana. People say pot is not addictive. And let me tell you, the pot itself might not be addictive, but you become dependent on it to cope. Right. And so for me, I, I have PTSD with dissociative symptoms and I've been dissociating since I was a kid. It's all I know how to do. When I'm stressed, I check out. And so with the fact that pot is highly dissociative, it was really easy for me to cope. I just didn't deal with my problems. I would just smoke a little bit and I'd get high. The problem became I enjoyed where I was more than where I was. And so I am the first one to say pot is addictive and the first one to say that it is so possible to have an unhealthy relationship with weed. And so I just don't think people talk about that enough. Like, I think people are like, oh, it's harmless. It's, it's not like it, it can really zap your motivation. It can zap your drive. It can change your health habits. It, it affects your sleep. It affects your mood overall, even when you're not smoking, when you become dependent on that as an escape. So, mm. well, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Another thing that I was thinking about is that you, you do fit that, that cookie cutter shape of a very fit, beautiful, young, vibrant <laughs> uh, yoga teacher. I guess this is mostly just for me. Say you were to gain 30 pounds and it was all in areas that you didn't like. <laughs> and I'm asking because there are times that I like how I look. And then other days like today where I can't seem to get my hair to do anything like that I want. <laughs> okay. What would be your self-talk in that situation? Because right now, like I said, you fit that bill of, of health, mm -hmm. uh, of what we think, what we're conditioned to think that health looks like. Maybe me, not so much, especially with all my clothes off. Do you, do you mean like it's, it might be easy for someone to say, well, it's easy for you to love yourself if you look like that. Is that That's, what you mean? I think that is an aspect of it. Yes. So could you speak That's to that? Part. Yeah, it's a, that's a really hard question that I have never been asked before. I have felt it, but I've never been asked it directly. I think that women and men, because I at Ecstatic Forest, I did naked yoga in a co-ed environment. In Houston, it's always with women. I'm looking to build it with men. I'm looking to find a man who can lead ceremony in the way or in his own way, but borrowing how I teach it and, and kind of share that maybe together. I don't know, but people, I'll say humans, and there are some that escape some, some that escape that are just not affected. I think my partner's one of them. I mean, his, his self-talk is different. He might call himself a, a skinny little runt from time to time. I hope he's never going to listen to this, but he, he, he might have that talk, but he doesn't believe it, right? He might just say those things, but it doesn't necessarily affect his, his actions, right? It doesn't affect his belief system. But I think a lot of people, the majority of us have been conditioned to pick ourselves apart. So just because I look a certain way doesn't mean I don't have the same or worse internal struggle as you. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying that it's possible to have the same battles, the same struggles. I might have just been, I mean, I had an eating disorder. I was fully anorexic for a while. I was taking, I took, well, I won't, I don't want to talk about it. So I should say trigger warning. 
I was eating less than 800 calories a day. I was doing fasting in the name of health and deceiving myself. I was doing all sorts of different things. And I got really good at being skinny because I wasn't like that growing up. And now my body's normalized and I'm, let's see, 30 pounds heavier than I was at my skinniest. But I was really unhealthy and I was really unwell. And mentally, I'm way better than I, than I ever was, right? The, the noise has stopped. The more I've, I've dripped, dripped, dropped into self-love. And that starts with, because it's not easy to go right to the part, because I, I don't know, my experience is that I really hyper fixated on my tummy. From age 12, I thought I looked like the Grinch. Because you look down, it's different <laughs> than when someone looks at you. Yeah. I don't know. And so, that, I mean, but I was 12 and I remember crying and just thinking that's what I looked like because my mom would say things like, you don't need that cookie right? She would deny treats and say, you don't need this or you're going to get fat. And, and obesity does run in my family. I was never obese, but I was overweight as a kid. And so I'm talking in circles because I'm a little flustered because it's a really hard question. So forgive me. You can't necessarily go right to like for me in my case, I can't necessarily go right to my tummy and be like, oh my God, I love my stomach. Because the belief that you have is that well, this part of me is wrong or broken. So how do we get around that is we start with saying nice things about something you do like, mm -hmm. right? Right. Start you, where you can. Yeah. That feels. You start where you can yeah. and start with movement and breath and forgiveness, movement, breath, and forgiveness. And from there with awareness. And one of my favorite things to say is it's all just data. All the thoughts, all the feelings, all the emotions that come up, they are part of being human. It's all just data. It's all coming in for your own awareness. And it's what matters is what you choose to do with that awareness. So I might have great days where I'm like, damn girl, you look good. And then I might have other days where I'm like, mm. but it's that awareness on the, mm, that is the new choice point. And it's like, well, that's not who you are anymore. I, I don't identify with that anymore because that's not who I am. That's not who I choose to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. One of the things that I appreciated, I was reading an Instagram post about never suck in your tummy again for pictures. And or I, in life. Or in life. So what happened, I, I re had read that post and then I went on this trip with sunshine through the rain for the kids and I was getting my picture taken and I felt that impulse to suck in my, my tummy. But then I remembered your post and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm going to just relax and be thankful for everything that my stomach does and mm -hmm. try and just be as gracefully and naturally myself. <laughs> and yeah, so I didn't, I didn't suck in my tummy. <laughs> How was that experience for you? It was, it was good. It felt very freeing. I had never had someone give me that permission before to not suck in my tummy for pictures. So I really liked that. Yeah, I've just, the, the belly is also a very soft spot, <laughs> pun intended, so, a, a soft spot with me because that's where I hold most of my weight is down here in my belly. And I was just vocalizing, verbalizing to my husband, I I'm feeling so frustrated right now because I have been taking steps to not eat as unhealthily as I used to sometimes have in the past. And it doesn't seem like any of the things that I'm doing are really making any type of 
progress. Some of, some of what we hold on to physically is also energetic in nature. And that that is beautiful. And I was going to say that this past week or two weeks, I, I found out with a traditional Chinese medicine, we have the five elements and most of us, we contain all five, but we will manifest or exhibit or give expression to one of those more than the others. Mm -hmm. And I found out that my dominant element is metal in Chinese okay. medicine. And that being said, um, the two organs that are associated with that are the lungs and the large intestine. Mm -hmm. And that the emotion that is associated with metal is grief. And it just, it was so interesting because the week before in a podcast, I had mentioned like, I, I don't know what's happening with my, my belly. That's the place where I hold everything. And then I found out later, okay, well, I'm a metal type and the large intestine is where I'm storing a lot of old grief and yeah so that just kind of goes along with what you're saying about how the things that we hold on to in our body are manifestations of emotional things energetic stuff yeah. there's a really delicate balance and I touched on this earlier there's a really delicate balance between because I'm in the fitness industry I'm not saying nobody should aspire to have a different body type. I'm saying there are so many body types and they are all valid. It's also valid because I think you can swing really hard in one way. You can come one direction that says, I have to be like this because this is what is considered beautiful. Absolutely not. There are literally thousands of different body types, probably millions. I don't know, probably as unique as you are. There's a few kind of main main ones that scientists who like to put people into nice little boxes have done. But you can also go the other way and just say, well, I'm just going to let everything go, right? And if you notice what I said earlier, there's a balance between approaching yourself it's from a place of self-love. So from a place of self-love, you said earlier, I want to not eat as unhealthily as I have before. But a way that you could say it is I choose to honor my body with adequate nutrition. So there's a subtle shift. In the one, it's I don't like this thing that I'm doing, this thing that I'm doing, I have judged as bad. And on the other, it's I wanna move in this direction. So moving in this direction isn't 110%, right? You don't have to just full steam ahead and only do this because then you're not loving the wholeness of your human experience because some days you just want Chick-fil-A. And that's okay, right? I'm wondering, like, okay, what's wrong with Chick-fil-A? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying fast food in general. I had Chick-fil-A. Yeah, yesterday. yeah. I, I had Chick-fil-A yesterday, and it was in my fridge when I was getting my water. Before this, I saw the cup, and I was like, yeah. So some days, some days you just want junk food. It's not saying I'm never gonna do these things. It's knowing that the decisions that you make come from this place of worship right? For your body, of reverence for your body, for the things that it can do, for the things that it has done, and for the things that it will do. Does that make sense? Yes. And I, I have struggled with mental health in my past. And it's one of the things where over time you begin to realize that the way your body feels is a huge determinant on your emotional well-being and what mental spaces you find yourself in. Mm. That is a, a dance that I know intimately well. I deal with chronic pain. And so I totally understand that on days where I am in a lot of pain, my bandwidth, my window of tolerance is so small right? Say, and it might not be physical pain, it might be emotional pain, right? But on days where you're having a, a challenging or difficult day, your bandwidth is smaller, and that's okay, right? We get to have those days. We don't have to, especially in the feminine, all human beings, yes, but especially in the feminine, 
the feminine cycle is a longer cycle. The masculine cycle is a 24 hour cycle. Men can just wake up and do the same thing every day and rinse and repeat like it's no big deal. But women have seasons, women have cycles where we're not going to show up exactly the same every single day. Think about our period, right? Think about our menstrual cycle. There are times of the menstrual cycle where you have more energy and times where you have less energy. There's times where you're more creative and there's times where you're more reflective. Right? We work in cycles and it's letting go of the expectation that you have to show up. Firstly, that's prescriptive. That goes out the window. Any should or have to, that just throw it out the window. Getting rid of that because inherently expectation contains judgment, mm-hmm. right? Because if you don't meet the expectation, then, then what does that say about you? Well, I just checked the time and we haven't even gotten into what I actually wanted you to come onto the podcast for, (laughs) but I am so glad that we talked about all of this because these were things that I I feel like they needed to be talked about. Yeah. But I'm going to try, because I do have a hard stop about 1.30, so. One, two, I'm just putting this out there. I'm happy to come back on if you want to talk about kink therapy in the part two, and we can just keep talking about naked yoga and body positivity in part one. If that's, I'll give you that invitation. Yeah, let's do that then. Because I feel like there could be so much more that we could talk about. I don't, sure. I, hate to, I hate to just give us 30 minutes when we have these other segments to do. So yeah, I would love to do that. Talk about the kink therapy. Thank yeah. you so much. So that means I can get my thoughts back to what we were talking about rather than trying to switch gears all of a sudden. Yeah, it was going to be hard for me too, mentally. So yeah, no, I just wanted to put that out there. This happens. I've done a couple of podcasts and I'm a talker, so it happens. No, I love it. I think that rapid holes are such synchronicities and something that comes up that you don't even think is even relevant to the conversation. It's weird how it will come up with another guest the following week or, or something. It all ties together. It's beautiful. Can I say one more thing on the note of positivity? Because I don't want to just leave it there because that's a kind of a hard, awkward ending for me, at least. Mm -hmm. I want to say that I know I intimated, you can love yourself exactly where you're at and desire to be a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. There, it doesn't have to stop with acceptance as a flat end point. Acceptance can be dynamic and can be changing. And you can love the fact that you are in a change process. And you can love the fact that it's a season or a time for you to just enjoy the view right? You don't have to always be in a healing journey or have to always be on a growth journey or have to always be on some kind of journey. Sometimes you can just be enjoying the view. And so for me, self-love is, I mean, it's a forever journey because I'm someone who's struggled my whole life with mental health. And so it's always a challenge in a way, like there's good days and bad days right? But I do what I do because I understand how the bad days feel. And I want to provide some kind of relief for other people's bad days too. Does Mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I I think that toxic positivity, that it, it doesn't help anyone. But what does help is when someone can come along when you are in those icky depths not, not shame you for being there or feeling a certain way, but just coming alongside you and being like, you know what, I've got your back. Or if you want someone to talk to, I'm here to listen. And yeah, sometimes life sucks. And (laughs) like some of these things that are really, really helpful. I think sometimes in the wellness community or spiritual community, you're not really allowed to have or take mental health days, right? Because it's a lower vibrational way of being. (laughs) I disagree. I don't know. Like I am, I am here for the, for the thunderstorms and the sunshine. Like to me, 
it's it's the rain. I don't know why we're I'm getting metaphorical now, but let me gonna roll with it. It's the it's the rainstorms that make things bloom, right? That's where you get the the depths, like your awareness is just fully on fire. Sometimes we get stuck, and that's all right. Like sometimes we get stuck, and it is what it is. But bringing adding in awareness to whatever we're going through, even if we're stuck, is a way to maybe not on that day or that week or that month, but to be like, hey, remember when we used to think this and now we think this? Look at that, right? Or hey, that's weird that I think this. I don't think that's true. And then you get really curious about where did that story come from? Where did that belief come from? Where did that memory that seemed so insignificant that you just buried deep inside your body somewhere? We can work with the somatic tools to bring awareness to them and celebrate the awareness when it comes, right? I was working with a client recently who we went into a somatic process and out of nowhere, this moment from seventh grade just appeared in his awareness. And it was a really bad traumatic moment for him. And I was like, (laughs) hooting and hollering. I was like, yes, I'm so glad this is here because then you can work with it. Mm -hmm. it's not what's wrong with me. Why is this here now? I thought I was done with this a long time ago. It's like, oh, right. My body is finally letting go. My body is releasing. My body wants to let go of this. And, and we can do that. Yeah. I love that. I was just putting out there some of the shit talk from (laughs) toxic positivity and you're like, "Uh uh-uh, nope, I don't (laughs) agree with it. I think we need those champions of paradox. One of my favorite authors, Robert A. Johnson, he talks about how kind of like the answer to life is found in paradox. It's not this or that. It's how both are true at the same time. And so when you're talking about the thunderstorm is what brings the flowers and you're here for all of it. That's the kind of community that I'm trying to find more for myself and Just appreciate for what it is and maybe not get stuck in those darker places where I was, but find tools to help me, like you were saying, experience it as it comes and allow it to flow. And because I think that's what has happened is that so much of it has just gotten stuck because I haven't allowed myself to fully experience or I just stuff the trauma. And so it's just staying in my body. And if I can allow myself to feel my feelings instead of being like, oh no, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Only rainbows and sunshine and that kind of thing and just stuff it. It doesn't allow it to flow in and out. Exactly. And And so I want to be clear. It's not that I don't agree with you about toxic positivity. I agree with you that toxic positivity has no place in my world. Positivity has a place in my world, but so does negativity. And so does letting it flow right? Getting it stuck and putting judgment on how you should be or how you should feel to be welcome into a community. That's not a community I want any part of, right? Mm -hmm. If I have to be this person and I've been through that, like I remember when I first joined the community here, I was going through stuff and I just felt like, wow, all these other people are so much further along than me. And I just don't know if I belong here. And that was my own judgment. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anybody else's judgment. It was just, I saw other people on good days and the more, not the more, let me just, some people have more good days and some people have more bad days. I certainly used to have only bad days and now I have mostly good days, but I still have bad days too. I think we're just not used to seeing people on their bad days because for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe they chose to not show up that day. (laughs) Maybe they chose to show up differently. Yeah, I'm here for all of it. Come hang out with me. I'm here for all of it. How can people find out more about you and follow what you're making in your own sandbox? So I am on Instagram and a couple of places. My main Instagram account where mostly everything flows through is body mind B like a bumblebee. And it's body mind B all one word. And I'm on there as the mind body coach. Probably will be changing that back to my name, but we'll see. 
And I am also on Instagram at Kink Therapy Official, which we didn't really talk about today, but it's there. And I'm also on Instagram at East Meets West Training. I'm on Facebook as Bianca Davis, located in Houston. I believe my Facebook ID is also Body Mind B. In the Lifestylist podcast, Luke's story ends his pods asking his guests this question. So I enjoy it so much that I include it in all of my episodes. Who have been three teachers or teachings in your life that you might share with our audience that they could go research and also learn from? So off the top of my head, my first yoga teacher, two, I'm going to say two yoga teachers. My very first yoga teacher, her name is Callie Sorensen. She is a wonderful human being. She taught me that yoga wasn't so serious and that it could be super playful and super fun. But she is also currently on a mission to raise awareness about spiritual abuse and narcissistic abuse. And she has a thing called red flag education, but that's, that's a kind of a new focus for me. I learned a lot about self-love, self-accept, not so much self-love, but self-acceptance through my human design through her as you well. You are a projector, right? Is that I am a projector. Can you tell? <laughs> well, I was going to say that the projectoriness was definitely coming through during that eclipse thing where you were just paying attention to so much detail. It was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm a 5-1 self-projected projector. Mm. And people who know me are like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's you. So I talk, right? Yeah, I'm a right projector. But Callie, I learned human design initially from her and I learned yoga through her and she is just a wild and crazy, super fun human being that leads by example of the life that you are wanting to create can be as full and rich and playful as you want it to be. I will say she is on her own little healing journey right now not little, big healing journey right now coming out of a cult. And so things might be a little different over in her world as she talks a lot about spiritual and narcissistic abuse. But that's also fantastic because I'm a survivor of narcissistic abuse. And so I'm still learning from her. It's just a different side of things. So yeah, that's the first one. Callie Sorensen. Her Instagram is Callie Sorensen. That's it. And then my second is my yoga teacher who in India healed me or taught me that I could heal myself, restored my belief in myself. His name is Mahi, and I'm trying to find you places where you can find these people. Were you able to go to India to learn from him, or was this one of the wonders of Zoom that you were able to get? No, I've been, I've been to train with him three separate times. His Instagram is Mahi Yoga Center. 10 out of 10. Highly recommend. This man saved my life when I was incredibly narcoleptic, which most people don't believe me when I say I used to have narcolepsy, because that's not a sentence you normally hear. But through yoga, through pranayama, he told me and told, he, he had full belief that I would be healed. And maybe not the words he used, but he said, do these three breathing exercises, do these three yoga poses. You will work with me during your teacher. They almost didn't want to let me do the teacher training, but I was like, no, I proved to him my self-belief that I could do it. And that allowed him to say, okay, you can do this teacher training. Cause I was already in India and he was like, I don't know, there's no hospital. If I would fall down and hit my head, there's nothing they could do. So it was a liability, but I said, no, I can do this. And he said, okay, but you work with me for an extra hour every day. And I said, okay. And within 21 days, I was off of all my narcolepsy medications and I have been sleep attack free for seven eight, nine years now, 2014. So however long 2014 is eight years now. 
so Mahi Yoga Center on Instagram, super amazing, amazing teacher, therapeutic yoga. That's where you want to go. And a third one. It's a third one. Let me ask my body. Mm. This isn't a teacher. This is something that I think is really important to talk about. Your body is a source of wisdom. Being able to tap into your own body's wisdom through developing your intuition and refining. Oh, you did, <laughs> you did it. Refining your awareness through discernment, through presence. Mm. Your body wants, like you are not your body, right? You and your body are working together. And when you work together, you are the best team. The intuition is there. You know what you want. You have discernment. And I think a lot of people, like we talked about yourself included, myself included, hold on to so much. Like that's just what human bodies do. We just hold on to stuff. I'm trying to get a nugget out of this because it was a nugget in my brain and then it didn't come out as a nugget. But your body... Your trauma, your triggers can be your greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. There's a nugget. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I want to thank you, Bianca, so much for joining me in Sheffy's Sandbox. And we've made it official that this is going to be just a, a part one because as we were talking about, we didn't even get to the part that I had invited you to talk about on the podcast to begin with. So we will be coming back for part two to talk about kink therapy. Which I've is not that kinky and not actual therapy. And so I always joke that I need to work on the name. And in reality, I'm probably never going to change the name. Uh, <laughs> it is just what it is. And it's a good, a good starting point, a good, a good talking point to say, just to warn people. It's not that kinky and it's not officially therapy. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Bianca. And uh, until next time. <laughs>